Let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord, again, we just come to you. Uh, we thank you for being more powerful than the enemy in this world. And so, Lord, we again just pray that you would uh, take control, that you would bring our focus back to you at this moment, and that you would speak to us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay. Amen. So now, we've all heard the common phrase that a picture is worth a thousand words. So here are a few pictures that have a lot of meaning. So here we have two pictures. They're by the same artist. His name is Rembrandt. And he was um, famous for painting a painting called The Prodigal Son. And so in the he likes to put himself in his painting. So in the first painting, here he is as the prodigal son, partying and doing what the prodigal son did. And then in the second painting, it's him as the father accepting his son back into his arms. Amen. So here we have another painting, but this is one that you can, like, that has many different interpretations. I like to think that this is like a mother because you can see that she has her kids and she has so much going on around her, like our mothers today. And then here we have a more common picture that all of you can interpret for yourself. So today we are going to look at a biblical picture that conveys the most, one of the most important messages mankind will ever hear, and that's the message of the gospel. And it's the good news that, about everything that Jesus has done to save us. I'm excited about that, Gabby, tonight. And uh, so, so what is this picture? So this picture is the Old Testament sanctuary that God instructed his people to build. But how do we know that this is a picture of the plan of salvation? Well, that's a good question, and, and we know this for at least two reasons. And the first reason we get from comparing two scriptures together. Um, so the first scripture is Isaiah 59, verse 2, and it says, But your iniquities, in other words, your sins, have separated you from your God. So it's very clear that sin is what causes separation between us and God. Now I want us to look at uh, our next text in light of this one. And that is Exodus chapter 25 and verse 8. God is speaking to Moses concerning his, uh, the people of Israel. And he says, And let them make me a sanctuary. For what purpose? That I may dwell among them. Now, what is it that separates us from God? Sin, right? But somehow, the sanctuary allows us and God to reconnect, to reunite. Teaching us that the sanctuary then is all about salvation. It's all about being reunited with God. Now the second reason, uh, go ahead and share that with us, Gabby. So the other reason we come to this conclusion is because according to the Bible, salvation is all about Jesus. And here we will see that everything in the sanctuary points to Jesus. It's all a big picture of him. So here we have the altar of sacrifice, which is in the courtyard with the laver where the priests would cleanse themselves before entering the holy place. In the holy place, we have the table of showbread, where, which was never empty, the candlesticks, which was continuously lit, and the altar of incense. The incense would go up and into the most holy place, where they had the Ark of the Covenant, and where God's presence dwelt. Amen. All of these things point, in some way, point back to Jesus. Exactly. Just to give you some examples of that, um, around the sanctuary was called the assembly. That's where the people of God actually lived. They pitched their tents and they dwelt there. And so even that represents Jesus. It's pointing us to Jesus because in John chapter 1 and verse 14, it says that, that Jesus, the word of God, came down and he, he tabernacled among us or he dwelt among us. So this is pointing us to Jesus. Of course, the lamb that was sacrificed in connection with the sanctuary service um, uh, John the Baptist makes it very clear in John 1.29 that that lamb is uh, Jesus. And Jesus is the lamb of God. So the lamb is pointing us to Jesus. Uh, the altar of burnt sacrifice where the lamb was sacrificed, uh, that's obviously teaching us about the cross. That's where Jesus made his sacrifice for us. Uh, the laver where the priests would wash their hands, uh, that's pointing us to Jesus too. Because in John chapter 4 and verse 10, Jesus refers to himself as the living water. Um, the table of showbread in the holy place. Again, that's pointing us to Jesus in John 6, verse 35. Jesus again refers to himself as the bread of life that came down from heaven. Uh, the candlestick, uh, again pointing us to Jesus in John 8, verse 12. Jesus called himself the light of the world. Uh, the altar of incense, 
where the, the aroma would come into the presence of God. Uh, in Ephesians 5 verse 2, it describes Jesus and what he has done for us as a sweet-smelling aroma that entered into the presence of God. And then finally, in the most holy place where God's presence actually dwelt, his, his literal, physical, visible presence... Um, that's pointing us to Jesus too, because when Jesus came here as a baby, he was described as, he was called Emmanuel, which means God with us. Okay, So all of these things are pointing us to the fact that the sanctuary and the service, all of that was about Jesus. Okay, so, so far we've seen that the sanctuary is a picture of the plan of salvation, but what does it actually teach us about this one? And that's a good question. I want you to notice that, uh, in fact, let's go back there really quick. There are how many sections of the sanctuary? There's actually three sections. What we call the courtyard um, here. So this would be the courtyard. And these are two main things in the courtyard. Then you had number two, the holy place. And then the third compartment, third section of the, the whole structure is the most holy place. And so as we look at that, what we see is that that if this is a picture of salvation, it's teaching us that salvation really has three phases to it, three components to it. And so we're going to look at what each of those components are. But before we get into that, we really need to, to share with you some universal truths. And these truths help us to truly appreciate the plan of salvation. And so um, let's get back there. First one, Gabby. So the first universal truth is that everyone has sinned and therefore is under a death penalty. So we see this in Romans 3, 23. It says, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And then the penalty, Romans 6, 23, for the wages of sin is death. All right. Uh, and so this is a situation we're in where we, the Bible says all of us have sin. We all fall, fall short of the glory of God. And because of that, we're all under a death penalty. This is our situation. And the situation gets worse because the next universal truth is that there is nothing we can do to get ourselves out of this situation. Right? We're, we're sinners, and because of that, we are under a death penalty. We cannot get ourselves out of that situation. Uh, the prophet Jeremiah, in Jeremiah 13, verse 23, he asks a series of questions. Can the Ethiopian change his skin or the leopard its spots? And the implied answer is what? No. Okay? So then he, and then he makes the rhetorical statement, then may you also do good who are accustomed to do evil. In other words, he's saying, listen, the, the, we cannot change our skin color. The leper can't change its spots. Neither can we do good because we are accustomed to do evil. We cannot get ourselves out of this situation. Romans chapter 3 and verse 20 tells us, therefore, by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. What this verse is telling us is that, that there is nothing we can do to make ourselves right. We're, we're in a wrong condition. There's nothing we can do. Uh, that we, we can't do uh, good things in order to make ourselves right. It is absolutely impossible. So as we look at this, uh, does it sound like bad news so far? These two universal truths are bad news, right? Um, but we're not going to end here because there is good news. God has something better for us tonight. And that brings us back to this three phases of the plan of salvation illustrated through the sanctuary. So the first phase is taught in the courtyard where the lamb representing Jesus was sacrificed. It was through this sacrifice that the sinner was able to receive forgiveness of sins. So what would happen is the sinner would place their hand onto the lamb and symbolically transfer all their sins onto this lamb. And this lamb was sacrificed on the altar, representing Jesus, the true lamb, and his sacrifice on the cross. So in Colossians 1 verse 14, it says, In Jesus we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. So it is only through Jesus' blood we are able to receive forgiveness of sins. Amen. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, go ahead, I'm sorry. Okay, so uh, thank you, Gabby, for sharing that. Um, as we look at this truth, that forgiveness comes through the sacrifice of Jesus. It's important to note that Jesus' death was for 
everyone. Jesus died for everyone. In other words, everybody can benefit from the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. Forgiveness is available to all, okay? But the point we need to emphasize is that although it's available to all, it will only benefit those who actually make the choice to receive it. You see, God is a gentleman. That's another thing we can add to the list of characteristics of God. God does not force himself upon us. He doesn't force his will upon us. He gives us the ability to choose for ourselves. And so Jesus died for everyone, but only those who are willing to receive God's forgiveness will actually benefit from it. Okay, so pastor, how do we receive it? And that's a very good question as well. So I want us to look at it. They're really um, trying to simplify this, but there, there's really three steps that we can take that will enable us to receive God's forgiveness. The first one is um, that we must admit we are sinners. I invite you to turn in your Bibles, if you would, to 1 John chapter 1, verses 8 and 9. First John chapter 1, verses 8 and 9. And it says, if we say we have no sin, what are we doing? Deceiving. We are deceiving ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But verse 9 says, if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. And so the first step here, and this really makes a lot of sense. Before you can get help, you have to admit that there is a problem, right? And so we're not going to appreciate the, um, the forgiveness that God wants to offer us unless we come to the point where we admit we're broken, that we are sinful, that we have messed up, that we have fallen short of God's glory. So the first step is we must admit our sins. We, we confess our sins. Uh, the next step is that we have to believe that Christ's death can actually bring us forgiveness and that his death actually does stand in the place of our death. So um, one of the very popular verses of scripture is John 3.16. You may not have to look it up. Uh, you probably know it by heart. Uh, if you know it, say it with me. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Okay? So in order for, for what Jesus did on the cross to impact us personally, we have to make the decision to actually believe in what he has done for us. Believe that what he did is sufficient to... Uh, bring us forgiveness to deal with our guilt and to take away our death penalty. And then the final step, the third step, is that we have to choose to give our life for Christ. Uh, let's go in our Bibles to Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20. Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20. This is Paul speaking here, and he says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. In the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. So we admit that we're sinners. We believe in what Christ has done for us to save us. And we choose to live our lives for him. In other words, we surrender our control because the way we have been doing things has led us down a sinful path. Obviously, we're not doing things right. And so we have to take ourselves out of the control seat and surrender ourselves to Jesus so that he is in control of our lives. And so this, uh, these three things, admit, the believing, and the choosing to live for Christ is how we accept the gift that he has given to us. So the first phase of salvation is receiving forgiveness for our sins, but the second phase is taught by the holy place, receiving power to overcome sin. In other words, power to live a changed life. And the Bible is very clear that overcoming sin can be a reality for the believer. In Matthew 19, 16, it says, With God all things are possible. 
In 1 Corinthians 10, verse 13, we learn that with God, every temptation can be overcome. In Jude 24, we learn that Jesus is able to keep us from falling into sin. I want to make it clear that experiencing the reality of these verses is being connected with God. But, Pastor, how do we do that? Another very good question. Um, So, how we connect with God um, and stay connected with Him is actually uh, illustrated by the items we find in the holy place of the sanctuary. Remember there were three items there. There was the the table of showbread, there was the altar of incense, and then there was the candlestick. And each of those things, in a symbolic way, is teaching us how we connect with Christ and how we stay connected with Him. In other words, how we grow in our relationship with Him. So the first thing we're going to look at is the table of showbread. And as we look at Matthew chapter 4 and verse 4, we find that bread is symbolic of the Word of God. So in other words, what this is teaching us is that if, if we're going to tap into the power of Christ to overcome sins in our lives, we have to connect with Him through the Bible. That means we need to spend time reading this Word. We need to spend time uh, studying this Word and getting to know Christ through this Word. Um, the second one we're going to look at here is the altar of incense. Again, remember the, the incense would burn and the smoke would rise up into the presence of God. And Revelation chapter 8 and verse 4 tells us that, that that act was symbolic of our prayers, which as we offer our prayers also rise up into the presence of God. And so, again, if we're going to connect with Christ, we need to spend time in prayer. If you think about it, um, we're, we're talking about having a relationship with Christ. And it's just like having a relationship with anybody else. If you're going to build a relationship with somebody, you need to have what? Communication. communication, right? You need to talk to that person. That person needs to talk to you. And in that communication is how you build a relationship. And so um, as we're building a relationship with Christ, prayer is us talking to him. And Bible study and Bible reading is God actually then communicating to, to us. Okay, And the third uh, thing there in the uh, holy place was the candlestick. And as we look at Matthew chapter 5 and verse 16, uh, in fact, in verse 14, Jesus not only says that he is the light of the world, but he says that we are also the light of the world. And that's because when we give our lives to Christ, he then dwells within us. So if he's the light and he's now in us, then we become the light as well. But verse 16 tells us that... We should let our light shine so that others may see our good works and glorify our Father in heaven. So another key component in connecting with Christ and growing in our relationship with Him is sharing our experience with Him. Sharing His love and and the things that we know and understand about Christ. Okay, so... Uh, These things are going to help us to grow in our relationship, connect with Him. So that leads us then to the third phase of the plan of salvation. And that's taught by the most holy place. Remember, what's in the most holy place? You had the... Ark of the Covenant. You had the Ark of the Covenant, right? And then uh, inside was the Ten Commandment Law. But the top of the Ark of the Covenant was called what? It was called the Mercy Seat. And there were two angels on the side, and on top of the mercy seat, in between the two angels with the outstretched arms, was what? That was actually the presence of God, His Shekinah glory. Okay? So, it's in the most holy place where you find God's presence. So, we can think of the sanctuary as a model of the steps that bring us back into God's presence. So the first step is receiving God's forgiveness. The second step is receiving His power to overcome sin in our lives. And through that process, we become prepared to re-enter into God's physical presence. Okay? So that's the last phase. God is changing. He's dealing with our past. He's dealing with our present. And... Finally, he's going to prepare us to actually physically reunite with him. But in order to do that, in order to do that, God has to change us physically. You see, he's changed us spiritually through the first two phases of the plan of salvation. 
But when God is ready to reunite us with him, he's got to change our physical bodies. And this change is talked about in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, uh, verses 50 to 53. And I invite you to turn there in your Bibles and uh, read along with me. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, starting in verse 50. And it says, Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does corruption inherit incorruption. Verse 51. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be, what's that word? Changed. Changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So as we look at this verse, it's very clear that as God prepares to reunite us with himself at the second coming of Christ, he transforms, see, we undergo a radical transformation uh, God has already dealt with our character and our spiritual aspect, but now he changes the sin-infected body, gives us a new body so that we can enter into his presence and remain there throughout all eternity. Can you say amen? Amen. Okay. It is important to note that accepting Christ's sacrifice for us happens in the courtyard, but we don't enter God's presence until we go through the holy place. And this illustrates the fact that the plan of salvation involves both receiving forgiveness of sins and having the power to overcome sin. Okay, very good. So, <clears throat> the Bible is actually very clear on um, reinforcing what Gabby just shared with us. As we look at the sanctuary, we see those natural steps, that progression, forgiveness, overcoming sin, re-entering into the presence of God. And um, not only do we see it in the sanctuary, but there are a number of texts throughout Scripture that make that truth very clear as well. So we want to look at a couple of them. Um, first one here is James chapter 2, verses 17 and 18. And in this text, we see that true faith, truly believing in Jesus, always leads to righteous actions. Okay, So it's not just believing in what He's done for us, but that belief then has a tangible effect in how we live our lives. Okay, so that's John 2, verse 17 and 18. And then uh, in John chapter 8, verse 11, this is actually Jesus speaking here. There was a woman who was caught in adultery. And he says to this woman, he says, I do not condemn you. In other words, I forgive you. Okay, but then he's very quick to, to add on to that. He says, but go and sin no more. And so Jesus, in this one short encounter with this woman, in this one short statement, he's offering forgiveness, and then he's offering the power to overcome sin. Okay? Um, and then the last one, I want us to look at it together. If you would go in your Bibles again to Romans chapter 6 and verse 22. Romans chapter 6 and verse 22. Romans 6 and verse 22. And it says, But now having been set free from sin. In other words, having been forgiven of our sins and having become slaves of God, you have your fruit to, what's that word say? Holiness. Holiness. And the end, or the, the end result, the goal is everlasting life. So as we look at this text, it's very clear. We see the same three steps as we are seeing illustrated in the sanctuary. That the first step is forgiveness of our sins, being justified. That's the Greek word there. And then when we are justified, that leads to us producing fruits of holiness. That's living a changed life. That's overcoming sin. And the end result of those two things is everlasting life, being reunited with God in His presence. So we've learned tonight that this, uh, the sanctuary is a picture of salvation, and every single piece of the sanctuary points back to Jesus. 
The courtyard teaches us how to have forgiveness of sins. The holy place teaches us about how to have victory over sin. And the most holy place teaches us that God will fully restore us to communion with him. So the plan of salvation is essentially having forgiveness of sins, having power to overcome sin, and then finally being reunited with God in the end. At this time, we're going to ask our deacons to come by. They're going to uh, hand out a uh, little response card. If you go ahead and get those going out. Um, so that will be coming to you in just a moment. As it's coming to you, um, we've looked at these two essential truths. plan of salvation is God forgiving us. And then God giving us his grace so that we can overcome those sins in our lives. And so as we look at those two things, both of them are extremely important. Um, but they come in an order. We must first be forgiven. And out of that forgiveness, we can then live a changed life. So some of you, though, you know, you may be thinking about your life. You may be thinking about your past, your history, uh, maybe even your present. And you're thinking, you know what? I've done so many bad things. Um, I've just made so many mistakes. Can God really forgive me? And the answer is yes. You know, when God gave Jesus on the cross, here's what the Bible tells us. That Jesus is the creator of how many things? All things. All things, right? Everything exists because of Jesus. So when God gave Jesus on the cross, he was actually giving all of the universe and everything in it. When God gave Jesus, he was giving his, his all. Okay? So if Jesus created us and now he's the one dying in our place, if he's the one bringing us salvation, then he is more uh, than sufficient to provide that forgiveness for us. So no matter how um, bad our lives have been, the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross is more than sufficient to cleanse us of all of our sins and to empower us to live a righteous life for him. So you should have that card in front of you now. If I can have my deacons uh, pass me one as well. Uh, two, actually. You know, the message, as we present messages, we're not presenting messages for all of you. God is actually speaking to all of us. And so I want to give you one as well. And I'll take one. Uh, so you should have the card there in front of you. And there's just two questions I, I, I want to ask, two appeals I want to make. Uh, maybe you have never came to that place where you have accepted Jesus Christ and his sacrifice for you in your own personal life. You've never accepted him as your personal savior. And so if you've never done that before and the Holy Spirit has spoken to you tonight uh, and you want to make that decision, you want to take that step tonight, I just invite you to, to check that box there. I would like to accept Jesus Christ as my personal savior and surrender my life to him. Okay? Uh, maybe you've already done that, but as you've seen the plan of salvation again, you want to grow in your relationship with Christ, you want to recommit yourself to Him, then I uh, uh, invite you to check that second box which says, I would like to affirm my decision to accept Christ and live my life for Him. Because the Christian walk is not a one-time thing. It's a day by day by day. So every day we're making the choice. And so today we can reaffirm that decision to accept Christ and to live our lives for him. So if that's your decision, I'd invite you to check that box as well. Uh, you can put these into the little box at the, uh, the just outside the sanctuary on your way out. And uh, I invite you to bow your heads with me as we uh, close with the word of prayer. Father in heaven, Lord, we again thank you for this time we've had. Father, as we had this uh, intellectual study of what you have done for us. May it pass our intellect. May it reach to the depths of our soul. May we understand it with our heart as well as our mind. May we be broken and humbled because of what you have done for us and the amazing gift you are offering us through Jesus, your son. So, Father, may we live this place with surrendered lives to him, with faith in in his ability to save us, to both forgive us of our sins, to cleanse us of all unrighteousness, 
and to empower us to live righteously for Him. This is our prayer in His name. Amen. Amen.